Hi, so I'm from 10X Genomics. Just real quick, we build inst scientific instruments that we sell to cus customers, academics, pharma companies to do cool research like curing cancer, or hopefully. Um, we have a lot of computational biologists and other very smart researchers who are not software engineers but are still shipping code, so my job is to uh, keep them delivering code. If you've never, if you've never uh, used Conda before or interacted with it, it's probably because you've never interacted with a data scientist. They love it. Uh, they can just install stuff in their home directory. Um, very large package ecosystem, mostly Python-centric, uh, mostly pre-built pre binaries, um, kind of hermetic by design, which makes it a, actually a pretty good fit with Bazel. Uh, lots of RPath stuff and reasonably accurate package metadata, which we use later on here. Um, if you actually just want to see how the rules work, just look at the GitHub repo. We've published them publicly. I'm going to mostly be talking about lessons learned from building that rule set. Um, so our design goals were reproducibility. I think everybody at BaselCon knows why that's important. Uh, it needs to be a complete environment. It needs to actually work. Um, obviously. It needs to be a minimal environment. We don't want to be bringing in lots of dependencies that are necessary for some things but not others uh, when we don't need them, especially if you're using remote build execution. You don't want to have a gigantic input graph. Um, it needs to work correctly. Remote execution, we use remote execution. Uh, also sometimes local execution. And we need that to work the same way, ideally, as in production. Um, so you don't end up with things that only break in production, obviously. Um, and we want it, yeah, we want it to be pretty much the same for Bazel test versus when we deploy our product as a tarball. We want fast build times. And we also want it to, we want to avoid certain problems at runtime. Um, and we want to provide license and SBOM metadata. <clears throat> so build performance. We need to fetch each package in parallel, and we also need to not gate analysis of downstream targets on the uh, on, on fetching targets that they don't depend on. This is very important. Basically, what that translates to is that each package that you're fetching needs to be a separate Bazel remote repository. Um, and they can't directly reference each other, because if they do, then you can't do the analysis until you fetched all of them. You also cannot, you, we need to generate build files. We need to be able to generate each build file for a packet we need to generate the build file for a package without reference to anything else outside of that package. At runtime, that, that kind of runs into this problem at runtime where it's using our path for everything um, for, for shared libraries. That means everything needs to actually end up in a common shared directory. That is in conflict with having each thing, each package getting untarred into a separate remote repository. So we have this central repository rule that kind of pulls it all together and copies everything into, into that one place. It's also actually quite important for Python performance because each thing you add to the Python path is another, th another place where it has to stat several files, which you might not notice on a local file system, but most of our customers are deploying this on NFS, where a few milliseconds for a stat call adds up pretty fast. Um, Bazel mod doesn't need a lock file because, not, not really, because it has this minimum version algorithm so that even without a lock file, you should get the same version resolutions on a build from a given commit every time, in theory. Uh, Conda is not that way. Conda uses a more traditional SAT solver where you have greater than less than constraints and getting the same solution every time is just not going to happen because the remote repository gets updated. So we need to store a lock file. 
this isn't, this isn't bad, it isn't scary. We have a quick command to update that lock file, and we run it in a GitHub action cron job that takes a minute or so, and just opens a PR and updates it. I'll, I'll show you what that lock file looks like a bit later. You need to have escape hatches, because sometimes the package, this is a lesson for basically any package ecosystem. Metadata can be wrong. They can have incorrect license metadata. They can have, um, Conda doesn't have a concept of optional dependencies. So when somebody packages a package in Conda, sometimes it will include an optional dependency that you have no use for. Sometimes it will not include an optional dependency that you actually do need. So you need to be able to override that. Sometimes they just have typos in their metadata. Um, they'll depend on a package that doesn't exist. Uh, they'll have circular dependencies, et cetera. Sometimes uh, packages contain files you don't want, large text, large test fixtures, for example, um, files that are only relevant on Windows and you're only building on Linux. Um, some, sometimes some of the files are offered under a different license that is unacceptable to you, for example, GPL, or just has too many files. We've run into cases where remote execution fails because the uh, input manifest is too big. Um, we can propagate license metadata and just SBOM metadata through default applicable licenses, and I guess they're changing the name of that. Um, but it would be really nice if more rules, more repository fetch rules did this um, so that we could have a more complete SBOM that way and we didn't have to invoke a bunch of other tools. Lock file kind of looks like this. It's a, a BZL file. Um, we have the Conda package repository. Um, sorry, I, this is renamed, so this is slide is a little bit out of date. Um, you can exclude certain files with the glob. You can say here's some extra dependencies here, and then it's all kind of pulled together in one place. We have it can also create aliases that makes it easier to work with uh, build file generators that can say, oh, if um, if your thing depends on sklearn, well. It's just going to depend on at conda slash slash sklearn. Um, and then we have a lock file generator that says, here's the channels you're going to pull from. Uh, we're not going to use FFTW because that, uh, that has a, G a GPL license. Um, here's some extra packages that we're going to want to pull in from other things. We want to constrain to glibc 2.17. And we run it, and it just updates it and it's all fine. Very importantly, we cannot in those, when we do that auto update, if people went and manually edited those escape patches like excludes and stuff, the auto updater must not throw that away. Uh, we need to keep that. This is uh, a peeve of mine with various tools to do auto automatic updates to build files and stuff. They, they they can't try to be more clever than the human that made changes to it. Um, you shouldn't overwrite changes that people made manually. So in summary, in summary, when writing repository rules, you have to think very carefully about how you depend, how one repository depends on another, because unnecessary dependencies can really impact the build analysis time negatively. So Try not to depend on other repositories when you're generating a repository. Adding license metadata, really helpful. Provide an escape hatch because sometimes packages, sometimes you guess wrong about what the license is or other things about it. Uh, and don't, don't blow away those escape hatches when you automatically update things. And uh, that's, that's my talk. Uh, I encourage you to look at the rules if you find it useful, and uh, thanks.